Well, you may like to leave your Bible open at uh, Romans chapter 4, which I'll refer to it later on, and also Genesis. Uh, now let us join together in prayer, praying for God's help and blessing upon the preaching of His Word. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you that you have spoken and your word can never be broken. We thank you for giving us the lives of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And all these things are written for our learning, for our admonition, for helping us to live the Christian life. So, Lord, we pray for concentration. We pray that you may give us a greater interest in your word, a deeper delight in your truth. We pray that you may give us your Holy Spirit, the spirit of illumination. Lead and guide our thoughts as we consider the life of Jacob again. We pray that you may so lead the preacher that what he say may indeed be in accordance with your truth and be well-pleasing to you. Help us to receive your word by faith, with joy and gladness, and then we may bear fruit in our lives to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So dear friends, tonight... The Lord help us, we shall continue to study the life of Jacob. Uh, we are coming almost to the end, but not quite. Uh, there is still something we have to uh, look at concerning the life of Jacob. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 47. And let me read to you verses 7 to 10 again. Genesis chapter 47, verse 7. Then Joseph brought in his father Jacob and sat him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Field and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and he went out from before Pharaoh. Now friends, you may remember, I certainly hope you do, that how last lost the evening. We look at how Jacob left the promised land and went down to Egypt with God's promise and blessing. Yes, Jacob took his whole family to go down from the promised land. They were going to leave the promised land for something like 400 years and the Lord God said to Jacob go I will be with you and I will bring back your body to the promised land so Jacob went now can we all imagine what a joy it was for Jacob to meet up with Joseph again Jacob thought Joseph was dead for the past 20 years and more. Oh yes. But now he was told, Jacob, uh, sorry, Jacob was told that Joseph is still alive. Oh, imagine father and son embracing each other giving thanks to the Lord God for their reunion. And then, interestingly, Joseph brought his father to see Pharaoh. 
Jacob was presented to Pharaoh so that Pharaoh might be blessed by Jacob. Now surely Pharaoh was one of the most important uh, monarchs in those days. He won't have time for any trivial thing. But he has heard of Joseph's father. Undoubtedly, he would have heard of Joseph's faith in the living and true God, that Joseph would not worship idols. Uh, they believe in the Lord God, the supreme God who created heaven and earth, the only true God, the only living God, and all other gods are but idols. And Pharaoh longed to be blessed by this patriarch, Jacob, by this wonderful man of faith. Now surely it is the inferiors who are to be blessed by the superior. So actually Pharaoh we got a Jacob with the greatest honor. Pharaoh regarded Jacob as his superior. Now, I think we can point out that the Lord God blessed the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to live to an extraordinary age as his witnesses. I miss the worldwide idolatry. Now, all of them lived something like twice the usual lifespan. Can anyone tell us how long did Abraham live? I can't hear your answer, but that's okay. Abraham lived to 175 years. Isaac, 180. Jacob was 130 when he saw Pharaoh, and he was to live 17 years in Egypt to the age of 147. Now these are not ridiculously long life, but they are basically about twice the usual lifespan. God is putting his stamp on the patriarch that this man of God, father and son and grandson, they are mine. They are my special witnesses. So when this man tell you the well about me, they are bearing witness to the truth. Now Pharaoh politely asked Jacob this question, How old are you? Well, Pharaoh asked this question of Jacob out of respect. In days gone by, not now, uh, the Chinese custom, in terms of respecting older folks, people will ask the older person, how old are you? Not really uh, just to know the age, but out of respect, saying that, well, we are really respectful of you. Uh, we want to show your respect by asking your age. Now listen to how Jacob answered Pharaoh in verse 9. The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Field and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. Notice a number of things here. First, Jacob saw his life on earth as a pilgrimage. He regarded himself as living as foreigners and sojourners. He was just passing by the well. Well, the New Testament also tells us, we Christian people, we are pilgrims and sojourners. We are just passing through the well. Dear friends, we of all people are able to face the reality of our death. We say, here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. We are all pilgrims. Remember John Bunyan's book, Pilgrim Progress? 
We are pilgrims. We are to make progress. We are traveling to the celestial city, the heavenly Jerusalem. Are you seeing that of yourself? I hope so. Are you holding fast to the things of this world, saying that I cannot let this particular thing go? I hope not. We are all pilgrims. And then see how Jacob referred to his time on earth or to the length of his life. He says, the days of the years of my life and the days of the years of the life of my fathers. Isn't that interesting? He not only said, I'm 130 years old, but he says, the days of the years of my life. He count his life by day. Day by day, he lived by faith. Remember that song? Moment by moment. We live day by day. Moment by moment. By faith. But then, you notice also that Jacob said it with sadness. You can feel the tone of his voice or hear the tone of his voice he says here, Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So basically, Jacob is saying, Well, my life is nothing like the lives of my fathers. Now, in terms of Abraham and Isaac, I fall far short of what I should be. I'm nowhere to, com- to be compared to the lives of my father Isaac or the life of my grandfather Abraham. I have not been what I ought to be. Well, these are words of a man who says he has wasted much of his life and that he has not been obedient to God as he should and he fails to live up to his own forebears in terms of their spiritual and moral attainment. Now tonight I hope to consider with you the lives of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in relation to their spiritual experiences of New Testament believers. Well, years and years ago, I'll show you this book. This is a little Chinese book by the Chinese evangelist Watchman Nee. I bought this book when I was about maybe 15 years of age, and I did not read it for a long, long time. But this book, is a series of addresses given by Watchman Nee to his uh, congregation and co-workers as helpful and timely messages about living the Christian life. This book in Chinese is called The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Now Watchman Nee lived about, well, he ministered in the 1930s to the 1950s he was a great man of God. I do not agree everything with his theology. Uh, but there's no question that he loved the Lord. And he was a great evangelist. And under his ministry, revival happened again and again. Now in this book, watchmen argue that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is our God. And also, the experiences are reflection of our own experiences as New Testament believers. In particular, Watchman Lee says, the God of Abraham, or from the life of Abraham, we learn about justification. From the life of Isaac, 
We learn about sonship and heirship, inheritance. And from the life of Jacob, we learn about chastening and discipline, which we are privileged to have and we have to endure. When I read of his thesis on these three patriarchs and those three New Testament doctrines, I thought for a long while. I asked myself, is he correct? Is he making it too moralistic, so to say? But the more I think about that, the more I think he is right. That from the life of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, among other things, we can learn about justification, sonship, heirship, inheritance, and also chastening and discipline. I am not saying these are the only things we learn from their lives. But I'm saying that the basic thesis of Watchman Nee is correct in terms of seeing uh, the spiritual lessons we can learn from the free patriarchs. So let us test out what the Bible teaches us. First of all, the God of Abraham has to teach us about God's grace in justifying us by our faith in Christ. Let's turn to Romans. Romans chapter 4. After three tightly argued chapters on justification, in Romans chapter 4, Paul uses Abraham as the prime example and paradigm of justification by faith and not by works. I think that's very clear, isn't it? Romans chapter 4 is Paul citing Abraham as, a, as an example, a, a prime example of someone who is justified by faith, not by works. Now friends, consider this question. How can we be rightly related to God? How can we sinners be accepted by the holy and just God? That surely must be a vital question to us all. Tonight, or any time you're listening to this talk, if you feel you have sinned against the holy and true righteous God, you're going to ask this question, how can I be right with God? How can I be accepted by God? How can my sins be forgiven? Well, usually the answer we get over the world, down through the ages, is this. By instinct we say, how can I write with God? By trying harder, doing it better. And hopefully we will be accepted by God. Some people go for abstaining from some food. I remember a distant relative. Uh, years ago, she would abstain from eating meat when going to Yamcha when uh, there was something like a special Buddhist festival. And she think that in behaving in that way, she would be accepted by God. She dressed very plainly, almost like a Buddhist monk. Uh, none, I should say. Uh, and she thought, well, that would be pleasing to God, and so on. Now that, I say, is the universal answer by instinct. We, we should try better, do better, try harder, and hopefully we'll be accepted by God. But no one can be sure. I hope you know that the gospel is utterly counterintuitive. Only the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ tells us the way to be accepted by God is by faith in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not by our works, it's by faith in Christ that we are united to Christ and our sins are pardoned and our person are accepted 
by the holy and true God. And that is what the Bible calls justification by faith. Not by works. Now look at Romans chapter 4. You notice one thing. In Romans chapter 4, Abraham is repeatedly called the father of all believers. In verse 11. That he might be the father of all those who believe. In verse 16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Abraham is our father. Abraham is the father of all believers in Christ. Verse 17. Abraham is called a father of many nations. Now actually, you look at Romans chapter 4, how it begins. It begins by saying, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Abraham is our spiritual father. We, like him, are justified by faith. And then verse 3, Paul citing Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's way, way back to Genesis 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. In verse 5, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Oh dear friends, I love Romans chapter 4 verse 5. It says, We believe on God who justifies the ungodly. What comfort that is. If God justify the ungodly, those who believe in Christ, then I can be justified. No matter how wretched I may have been, no matter how greatly have I sinned against God, no matter what terrible things one might have done, you can go to a murderer, you can go to a terrorist, you can go to the most wicked criminal, and offer him Christ and the gospel and forgiveness and calling that person to come to faith in Jesus. And God will justify the ungodly who believe in him, in Christ. Now we we'll ask this question, as many people do. How can the righteous God justify the ungodly? How can God declare the ungodly to be righteous? The answer is because Christ the Son has bore their sins, suffered in their stead, paid the debt of their sins, fully satisfied God's perfect justice, and also because by faith in Christ, they are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And that's why the righteous God can justify the ungodly who believe in Christ. So truly, Abraham is our spiritual father. We are like him. Like Abraham, we are justified by faith, not by works. And Romans chapter 4, again, verse 12, we are to walk in the steps of the faith which Abraham, our father, had. Verse 18, Abraham, who contrary to hope in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. Yes, I think it's perfectly right uh, for watchmen to say that Abraham is a paradigm of justification. 
Oh, dear friends, that is not only true, but let us know that joy and confidence that justification brings to us. By ourselves, we can never live up to God's standard. We all fail miserably. So we will all be condemned if justification is by our works. Is it not true? Let me ask you. Does not your past sin haunt you? Do not our present failures mock us? Our repeated failures bring us down to the pit of hopelessness. But thanks be to God for the blessed confidence that justification by faith, by faith brings us. Horosis Bonner, a 19th century Scottish pastor evangelist, had a simple hymn. Part of it goes like this. Upon a life that I have not lived, upon a death that I did not die, and others' life and others' death, I stake my whole eternity. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. Friends, have you this joy and confidence of justification? Let us not look to ourselves, but to Christ alone. Our once and for all perfect sacrifice for sin and our perfect righteousness. Now let's move on to Isaac. Well, it's interesting that the Bible calls the Lord God Almighty as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. They are not three gods, but our Lord Jesus, for example, emphasizes the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, what's so distinctive about Isaac? If you read the life of Isaac, the one thing that stands out is that he's a very quiet person. Uh, he doesn't do much. Is it not so? Uh, Isaac did not live an adventurous life like his son Jacob. He did not make an epic journey like his father Abraham. Isaac just received everything. He did nothing new. He we dig his father's uh, the wells that his father uh, had dug. He didn't travel much. Isaac just stayed in the promised land all through his life. He was born there. He lived there. Died there. And he didn't come to the actual process of the land. He, he was there. And the Lord God confirmed the covenant of Abraham with him. We dare say, I think quite correctly to say, that sonship, heirship, inheritance are the characteristic feature of Isaac's life. Isaac was the son. He was the heir and he received the inheritance. He received everything by inheritance. Now, friends, think like this. He said this precisely what we receive by faith in Christ. We not only have our sins forgiven, but we are received into the family of God. We are made heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Now, please turn to Romans chapter 8. Verses 14 to 17. Listen to what Paul says about the Christian privilege. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Verse 15. To believers, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. 
Verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffered with him, that we may also be glorified together. You got it? We who believe in Christ, we are made sons of God. We become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. We receive the kingdom of God. We receive the inheritance. We are heirs. Galatians 3 verse 26 Concerning Christian believers, male and female, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now some people may object. Well, how come we are called sons of God, not daughters of God? Now this is not the Bible discriminating against women. Not at all, rather it's the contrary. Because in those days, only sons got inheritance. Daughters did not. But the point that the Bible and Paul in particular is emphasizing is that all believers, male and female in Christ, are sons of God. We all shall receive the inheritance. There's no distinction of the gender. Male and female, they all receive the inheritance of God. God himself is their inheritance. We are all made co-heirs with Christ. Listen to what Peter says in this first chapter, verses 3 to 4, the same teaching. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, we serve in heaven for you. My dear Christian friends, my dear believing friends, let us remind ourselves of the privilege and comfort of sonship. We are not just like Abraham, that we are justified by faith. We are also like Isaac, that we receive everything, especially the inheritance, by faith in Christ. We are made heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. Oh friends, may we know the privilege and the comfort of sonship. Oh believing friends, we have a blessed future, a glorious and secure inheritance. Some of you tonight, you may not be rich, you may not have a good life, you may not have a good family, but no matter what you may not have, if you have Christ, the future is going to be so much, much more better. In this life, we have troubles and sorrows, illnesses, sadness, bereavement, failures, heart breaks and so on. But we have a glorious inheritance that cannot be taken away from us. Let us be people who live by hope. For we were saved in hope. Let us no longer live in shallows and miseries anymore. Let us be like Isaac. Just receive everything as an inheritance looking forward to our blessed inheritance now we come to Jacob the God of Jacob from the life of Jacob as we have pointed out before quite a number of times we can learn about the reality and necessity of discipline and chastening. Jacob had a hard life. Oh, much more difficult than Abraham 
and Isaac. Abraham was the pioneer. Isaac was the heir. But look at Jacob. We're coming close to the, to the end of his life. Look at the sufferings he have gone through. We can see so clearly God's chastening hand was upon him time and time again. As he has done, so it was done back to him. We can see so clearly of God's chastening and disciplining Jacob. Why did Jacob have so many difficulties and sorrows in life? Because he needed it. You see, the one big problem of Jacob is that he was too confident, too capable, too strong. Yes, he was too capable and too strong, so con- too confident of himself. Now consider, I don't know whether you've thought of this before, but consider Jacob's enormous physical strength. At the age of 70, he could lift off the cover over a well all by himself when it usually took a few men to do that. Jacob married late in life at the age of about 77 or 78. And he had four wives. He fathered Joseph at the age of 90 and Benjamin much later on. Just consider such a man. He got enormous physical strength, extraordinary strength. He could slave himself day and night as a herdsman from the age of 70 to 90. And Jacob was so clever. He was resourceful. He could scheme, he could plan, he could lie. That was the problem of Jacob. He was far too smart. He was far too confident. Far too full of himself. And that's why Jacob was brought low time and time again. The Lord God disciplined him repeatedly. After Peniel, Jacob was limping ever since surely that would have weakened Jacob significantly and then Jacob faced bereavement after bereavement at the birth of Benjamin his youngest son his beloved wife Rachel died and you realize that Rachel would be much younger than Jacob some Jewish tradition mentioned that when Rachel married Jacob, she was 21 years of age. And Jacob was 77 or 78. And that tradition mentioned that Jacob, uh, Rachel died at the age of 36. Well, I don't fully trust Jewish tradition. But... Rachel certainly was much younger than Jacob. How sad it would be for an old man to see the death of his young wife. And then the apparent sudden death of his best son, Joseph. That was heart-wrenching. And of course, Jacob's ten sons, ten older sons, brought him unspeakable grief and sorrow. They lied to him. They committed incest. They murdered people. No wonder that Jacob said, Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. They were evil days. And my dear friends, Jacob is a paradigm that we need to be disciplined by our Heavenly Father. 
Turn to Hebrew chapter 12, verses 5 to 8. There we are told, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when we are rebuilt by him. Verse 6, for whom the Lord loved, he chastened, and scourges every son whom he received. If you endure chastening, verse 7, God deals with you as with sons, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? My dear friends, who believe in Christ, we all need to be disciplined and chastened by a wise and loving, gracious Heavenly Father. From Isaac, we learn about sonship and heirship, and sonship involves the privilege of being disciplined. But discipline is painful for the time being, but it is always for ultimate spiritual good. Well, as we close, let me remind you what I mentioned this morning about uh, Helen Rosevere as she shares in her book, Living Sacrifice, that her co-worker, fellow missionary, reminded her that God's ultimate goal for all believers is that they should be like his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. By nature, we are nowhere like Christ. By grace, God chastises us, He disciplines us, He chastens us, so that more and more we shall be like Jesus. His son. So I hope this is helpful to you. It has been helpful for me to read at least part of Watchman's book. And maybe when we meet again, we can discuss whether this is a valid way to see the lives of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I do believe so but I would like to hear your comment, your reaction. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that, like Abraham, we are justified by faith in Christ, like Isaac, we have become heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And yes, like Jacob, we do endure your chastening. O oh Lord, help us to be patient in waiting for your deliverance, to be submissive to your discipline instead of grumbling against you concerning the difficulties in our life may we be thankful and learn to trust in you O oh Lord help us to persevere to endure to believe to wait yes O oh God we do remember tonight there are many, many believers all over the world who are suffering terribly. Some from illnesses, some from mental distress, some, have, some are suffering persecution, some are in prison, or oh, some live in a time of spiritual desertion. Lord, be with them. And Lord, we do pray that you may hasten the coming of your kingdom. O oh Lord, advance your kingdom and be gracious to us 
We look forward that by your grace, we shall meet physically again and a fellowship together, face to face. In Jesus' name, Amen.